If war were to break out in the Pacific, the United States would struggle to field enough air power to dominate the airspace. At least, that's the conclusion drawn by multiple war games and expert analyses, and today, there are multiple efforts underway to resolve this problem. From swarms of low-cost drones to advanced AI-enabled drone wingmen that will fly alongside sixth-generation fighters, America is returning to air power in mass. And as a result, if war breaks out in the late 2030s, Uncle Sam will be ready. But what if war breaks out before then? The hard truth is, America needs to find creative new ways to leverage the systems it already has in order to be an effective deterrent while we wait for these technologies to emerge. And maybe one of the most cost-effective ways to do that would see the C-130 return to the flight decks of American aircraft carriers. Let's talk about why the U.S. military needs to send the Hercules out to sea. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is air power. This month, Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall will roll out a sweeping overhaul of the U.S. Air Force and Space Force, aimed at undoing decades' worth of technological and even operational atrophy caused by America's transition away from great power competition and toward the asymmetric conflicts of the Middle East. The goal behind these changes is all about repositioning the United States as more than a dominant military power, but as a deterrent force so potent and ominous to the nation's enemies that American air power hopefully won't need to win any wars at all, using its imposing presence alone to dissuade would-be adversaries. But getting there will be a massive undertaking, and explaining why is sure to make at least two different groups of frequent commenters really mad at me. So maybe we should start by just ripping off those band-aids, because those who see America's defense expenditures as bloated and wasteful will surely cringe when I explain that, despite the dollar figure of the U.S. defense budget continuing to rise, thanks in large part to inflation, America actually spends less on defense today as a percent of the nation's gross domestic product than it did throughout much of the Cold War. In fact, if U.S. defense spending matched the percentage of America's buying power today than it did at its height in the 1960s, the 2023 defense budget would have been more than $2.5 trillion, rather than the comparably paltry $816 billion Uncle Sam's gun clubs were forced to make do with. The sure-to-be-unpopular reality of deterrence in a geopolitical cold war is that it's expensive, and if we want the outcome of this 21st century arms race to mirror the peaceful conclusion we saw from the last one, we, as a people, will need to get over our collective sticker shock when programs are unveiled, or even worse, when they suffer setbacks or delays. Of course, those same commenters will argue that America's defense budget is already bigger than the next 10 or even 20 nations combined because they saw that fact in a meme somewhere. But the truth is, the figures reflected in those memes are self-reported. And it shouldn't surprise you to learn that nations with a systemic lack of transparency or oversight tend not to tell the truth about things like what they spend on their military. Recent expert assessments place China's actual military spending at north of $700 billion per year. Okay, now that that group's mad, let's move to the next one. Those who exercise the brand of American exceptionalism that causes them to take deep personal offense to the very idea that the U.S. may not be able to steamroll over any potential opponent. The reason this influx of money is necessary is because today's U.S. military is designed to win the last wars that it fought and not the next ones. Today, the U.S. military just can't match China fighter for fighter, missile for missile, or ship for ship in the Pacific. America's sprawling military apparatus is definitely vast, but in a lot of ways, it can't be allocated in its entirety to any one conflict without leaving serious defense obligations unmet elsewhere. And as we've seen in recent months with Ukraine and the Red Sea, conflicts are rarely polite enough to wait until your resources aren't spread so thin for them to kick off. All of this means that the combat calculus in the Pacific is not all of the U.S. military versus all of China's, but rather the assets and forces America can send to that theater 
versus the entirety of China's military. Now, those challenges are only made worse by China's decade-spanning practice of closely observing American combat tactics and conflicts all around the world, and then developing weapon systems not aimed at matching American capabilities, but rather at taking advantage of identified weaknesses within them or their employment tactics. One of the fundamental truths of warfare is just that it's a whole lot cheaper to damage, destroy, or degrade military capabilities than it is to design, develop, or build them. And China has spent years looking over America's suit of armor for weak points and then devising strategies and weapon systems aimed directly at those gaps. Now, to be clear, this is not just my assessment. In fact, there's a growing chorus of defense officials echoing this very sentiment within the Pentagon today. In fact, this is really why the Air Force is looking down the barrel of its biggest overhaul in decades. I'll quote Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall here. Xi Jinping has told his military to be ready to invade Taiwan by 2027. China is a thinking, well-resourced adversary. They're now thinking about the things we've said we're going to do and how they're going to defeat them. That's why we have to re-optimize. We're in a race, and we can't just hope we win. We have to actually do things to make sure we stay ahead. Today, there are dozens of efforts underway aimed at modernizing America's air power apparatus after decades of technological stagnation and combat operations in permissive environments. A new stealth air superiority fighter, a new stealth bomber, and a variety of AI-enabled drones known as collaborative combat aircraft are all in active development within the Air Force alone, all with projected service dates spanning the 2030s. But even the most optimistic timelines and budget projections don't envision viable fleets of these platforms in service until maybe midway through the coming decade. And that leaves the U.S. with an unnerving 10-plus years between where the Air Force is today and where today's planners believe it needs to be. Now, it's important to understand the difference between identifying shortcomings that need to be addressed and dismissing the combat capacity or the prowess of America's warfighters. If a war were to break out today, American service members would do what they always have. They'd fight, adapt, and find a way to win. But the truth is, winning such a bloody conflict would not feel like much of a victory at all. War games conducted by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, for instance, show American victory is all but assured following a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. But even the best outcomes still came at the expense of at least one, but often two, multi-billion dollar aircraft carriers, thousands of service members' lives, and countless aircraft lost on the runway to long-range missiles before they ever even got into the sky. The truth is, even an easily won war is a blood-soaked travesty that we should tolerate only out of necessity. The only really optimal outcome, then, is to deter such a war from breaking out at all. In a perfect world, we would do that with diplomacy alone. But in this deeply imperfect world, diplomacy is often only effective when it casts a broad, looming military shadow. So if deterrence is the goal, what will it cost? Well, a recent series of war games conducted by the Mitchell Institute to assess the potential strategic and tactical uses of collaborative combat aircraft, or AI-enabled drones, may tell us. All three of the Blue Force, or American-aligned teams, aimed to use a mass of low-to-medium-cost CCA, or collaborative combat aircraft, drones to blunt the sharpest edges of China's anti-access area denial strategy, as well as what some senior defense officials are characterizing as the most advanced integrated air defense apparatus on the planet. The concepts and methodologies these teams employed all called for using these drones in a variety of functions and launched in a variety of ways, including runwayless rocket-propelled launches and deployments from heavy payload bombers. This concept is meant to offset China's strategy of using long-range crews and ballistic missiles to wipe out local airstrips and keep American aircraft carriers at bay. The idea here is pretty simple. If China can increase the distance American aircraft have to cover in order to engage targets, they can decrease sortie rates, or the frequency in which aircraft can arrive to engage those targets. And by decreasing the number of aircraft in your local airspace at any given time, you make air defense a simpler exercise. Now, in the face of this Chinese strategy, the Mitchell Institute's proposals seem entirely sound, but 
They're predicated on the idea of a conflict breaking out in 2030 and on defense budgets between now and then allowing for the rapid acquisition of entire fleets of advanced AI-enabled drones and the sixth generation fighters required to relay commands in the fight, along with some other newly fielded autonomous systems to boot. So what does this mean for such a conflict if the U.S. doesn't manage to field thousands of CCA drones, dozens of sixth-generation fighters, and the battle management networks required to manage all of them by 2030? The truth is, if China has carefully watched the American military conduct combat operations the world over and has developed weapons and tactics aimed specifically at mitigating standard practices, well, then deterring conflict with China will have to mean demonstrating the American military's ability to adapt today, using weapons and platforms already available and relying on technology that's already proven, but in surprising and effective new ways. Now, there are lots of ways to go about doing this, some of which we've discussed on this channel before, but today I'm going to propose what might sound fairly harebrained to you, but really might work. And that will entail putting the C-130 back on American aircraft carriers. And if it surprises you to hear me say putting it back on them, let's take a quick stroll down memory lane to get you caught up. All the way back in 1963, the U.S. Navy wanted to explore the possibility of resupplying aircraft carriers with larger cargo aircraft than the existing carrier onboard delivery, or COD, platforms they had in service, like the C-1 Trader. So they turned to the broadly capable C-130 and to Navy F-4 pilot, then Lieutenant James Flatley III. Now, I had the honor of speaking with now-retired Admiral Flatley about this incredible exercise just a few years ago, and if it sounds crazy to you now, you should know that it sounded crazy to him then. When he first received the assignment to land a modified Marine Corps KC-130F on the deck of the USS Forrestal, some 500 miles off the Boston coast, he thought the Chief of Naval Operations was messing with him. Flatley had never even flown a quadprop aircraft before. He was a fighter pilot who honed his carrier landing skills with jets purpose-built for the job that came with handy things like a tail hook to arrest the aircraft's forward momentum before careening off the front edge of the ship. His KC-130, the largest and heaviest aircraft ever to attempt a carrier landing, had no tail hook. In fact, the ground crew even painted the words, Look Ma, no tail hook on the side of the plane. The only modifications made to this aircraft were the removal of its underwing refueling pods, smaller nose landing gear, and an anti-skid braking system. On October 3rd, 1963, Flatley, his co-pilot, a flight engineer, and a Lockheed engineering test pilot set off for their first attempted landing, cruising into a 40-knot headwind. According to Lockheed's chief engineer, who was already on the ship at the time, he watched the bow of the Forrestal pitch up and down by at least 30 feet as the vessel steamed forward through the choppy Atlantic waters, making Flatley's landing attempt all the more nerve-wracking. But naval aviators are a different breed, and Flatley brought that massive cargo plane down onto the Forrestal's flight deck with expert precision on his first try, missing the carrier's control tower with the tip of his own wing by less than 15 feet. From there, Flatley proceeded to conduct no fewer than 21 unarrested full-stop carrier landings and 21 more non-assisted takeoffs at gross weights ranging from 85,000 all the way up to 121,000 pounds. Once he had the hang of it, Flatley could land a fully loaded C-130 on the 1,000-foot carrier flight deck and bring it to a full stop in just 460 feet. He needed only 745 to take off at the same weight. In fact, as Lockheed's Ted Limmer later recalled, in some of these flights, Flatley even managed to land the C-130 in such a short distance that he was able to take off again from right where he stopped. And again, we're not talking about an aircraft that was equipped for catapult launches. This was entirely under the Hercules' own power. Flatley's success proved to the Navy that they could ferry payloads as large as 25,000 pounds to carriers as far out to sea as 2,500 miles, making it an entirely feasible heavy-lift COD aircraft that could deliver aircraft parts, munitions, and anything else a carrier might need to stay in the fight. But the entire operation was still a lot more dangerous than relying on the smaller, purpose-built aircraft for the job. And at the time, there was no pressing need to deliver larger payloads to carriers underway. So the Navy took what they learned and slipped it into their back pocket without 
any clear intention of ever putting this concept into practice. As I mentioned earlier, Flatley would go on to become a rear admiral in the U.S. Navy, commanding his own Forrestal-class supercarrier, the USS Saratoga, just a few years down the line. And that, officially, is where the story ends. But when I discussed his time landing the C-130 aboard the Forrestal with the Admiral, he did add one more interesting bit of context that's stuck with me ever since. In my mind, the C-130 COD exercise was akin to the CIA and Navy efforts to fly the U-2 off of aircraft carriers. Sure, it was successful, but maybe it was a bit too impractical to see real use. The Admiral, however, seemed pretty adamant that this capability was not just something the Navy had experimented with and then left on a shelf to collect dust. Instead, he said it was a capability the Navy continued to keep handy, as there could yet be good reason to see the Hercules return to shipboard duties, especially, he said, if war were ever to break out in the Pacific. And what's more, he even highlighted how modern supercarriers like the Nimitz and especially the Ford classes would be even easier to operate C-130s from. In fact, he even said that these carriers could probably support multiple C-130s at a time if they ever needed to. Now that alone is awfully interesting information, but when you combine it with the Air Force Research Lab's Rapid Dragon program, it becomes a whole lot more than that. As we've already discussed, waging war with China in its own backyard would require a huge amount of air power to degrade the anti-air and anti-ship systems that collectively create the framework for China's anti-access area denial strategy. And in recent war games, low to medium cost CCA drones were used for these purposes based on the assumption that they would exist in sufficient numbers by the time such a conflict broke out. But if a conflict were to break out before these new platforms emerged, Rapid Dragon could do a suitable job of standing in. The Air Force Research Lab's Rapid Dragon program is, to put it simply, a palletized missile launch system that can enable C-130s or C-17s, cargo aircraft, to launch a large volume of low-observable cruise missiles from standoff ranges. It includes a modular palletized munition system that allows for stacks of six missiles per pallet in the C-130 and as many as nine per pallet in the C-17. These pallets were designed to accommodate the AGM-158 Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, or JASM, but it stands to reason that they could deploy the longer-ranged JASM-ER, as well as its sister missile, the AGM-158C Long-Range Anti-Ship Missile as well, because they all have the exact same exterior dimensions. These pallets are rolled off the back of the aircraft like any other airdrop, and once deployed, a parachute opens to stabilize the pallet as the onboard control system fires the missiles to begin their track of likely greater than 600 miles, carrying an 1,100-pound explosive warhead to targets on land or at sea. Now, the Air Force's more modern C-130Js, leveraged in Rapid Dragon testing, can accommodate up to six pallets, but because of the weight of these missiles, each weighing in at over 2,250 pounds, the C-130J would probably be limited to carrying two pallets, each equipped with six missiles for a total of 12 per sortie, with the larger C-130J TAC-30 probably capable of carrying as many as three for a total of 18 missiles. With an estimated range of around 2,071 miles while carrying that sort of payload, that gives the C-130J a combat radius of around 1,000 miles. Add the max range of the JASM ER, which is reported to be between 500 and 650 miles, and this gives today's C 130s the ability to strike targets from more than 1,500 miles away from where they take off, without even needing mid flight refueling. Now, with China's goal to engage U.S. airstrips throughout what's known as the First Island Chain, which includes Taiwan and parts of the Philippines, even these extended ranges might not be enough to hold Chinese shoreline defenses at risk with Rapid Dragon munitions. Though Rapid Dragon C-130s armed with the long-range anti-ship missiles could still be very effective ship hunters. But if these C-130s were to, say, land on aircraft carriers operating just outside the reach of China's hyper supersonic DF-ZF anti-ship missile at a bit more than a thousand miles out, 
they could quickly refuel and continue onward to deploy their munitions and then turn tail and run before they enter reach of Chinese air defenses. Now, importantly, this would still put carriers in range of China's longer-ranged anti-ship ballistic missiles. But at these distances, the kill chain required to score a hit would have to be extremely robust, and carrier strike groups are more than capable of intercepting most inbound ballistic missiles. By coordinating these strikes with reconnaissance and bombing operations conducted by B-21 Raiders, as well as volleys of ADM-160 miniature air-launched decoys deployed by B-52 bombers also operating outside engagement range, C-130s with Rapid Dragon pallets could provide a low-cost, high-effect means of overwhelming Chinese defenses with the same volume that wargamers aimed to use drones for in the not-too-distant future. Now, there are some important caveats here, like the need to increase production on the JASM ER and the long-range anti-ship missile. And it's also important to understand that modern C-130Js are heavier and more powerful than previous iterations, making it less of a certainty that they could operate from carriers, but it still seems pretty likely. But even if that all worked out, this isn't a magic bullet. Such a conflict would still be bloody and brutal, but the real value in demonstrating this capability wouldn't necessarily be to leverage it in an actual war, but rather to use this capability as a stand-in deterrent against Chinese aggression until more robust and technologically advanced means enter service. Put simply, operating C-130s off of American aircraft carriers could provide a sufficient threat to throw China's existing combat calculus off balance, and that alone could be enough to push any timeline for the invasion of Taiwan back by a year or two or maybe even three, potentially far enough for these new capabilities to be brought to bear. At which point, the deterrence mission could be passed off to these new technologies, platforms, and systems. But what do you think? Am I crazy? Or would you like to see the Hercules return to carrier operations? And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.